Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Remind you that Slido collaborative write notes and children are available for use. The following talk is notes about moving from Python to C++. The speaker is Yong Yu Chen. The speaker is a HPC software developer. Let's welcome the speaker, Yong Yu Chen. Thank you very much for joining the session for this discussion of not using Python. And good morning. Um, name is, my name is Yong Yu Chen, and I'm an engineer, and I write code in both Python and C++. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about why not use Python. Uh, you'll see. <laughs> Before everything, I'd like to say that if your code is already working, do not fix things that is not breaking. Okay? Just don't try random things and break your system. That's not wise. The context for me to suggest to move from Python to C++ is because that uh, we are doing, or I'm doing, numerical calculations. The problem demands for a great deal of computing and it involves very complex math. And Python, um, while we are moving away from it, uh, we are still using that. Python should not go away. Even for the massive computation we need, we still need Python to control the system. So what we really need to move to C++ is the computing kernel. And uh, the results will be making the system into a hybrid system, which will include both Python and C++. Uh, I'd like to extend uh, the introduction to myself. Um, I, by training, was a computational scientist. Um, and uh, it is not to say I'm a computer scientist. They are different. I'm not a computer scientist. And uh, we um, uh, train ourselves uh, to use computers to do the work. Like my background is actually fluid dynamics, so I call myself as a computational fluid dynamics or, or a mechanics. Uh, but in my day job, what I'm doing for a living right now is to write high performance code for computational photolithography. The, the subjects uh, for industrial applications of scientific computing like that is not well known. Very few people are doing things like that. So to help the community, I am also spending some time to teach uh, a course in graduate school to discuss how to write software like this. And uh, the talk today actually is a condensed version of the course, so which takes like uh, 15 weeks, but I'm going to spend like 25 minutes to tell you what about it. Okay. So this is my past work. Uh, I'd like to show you some examples, give you ideas about what I'm talking about for numerical calculation. So this is about to solve the so-called conservation laws. They are partial differential equations. The computation simulates any physical processes that are governed by the system of first-order hyperbolic partial differential equations. Okay. So this uh, picture in the lower left is uh, stress waves propagating in solids. And the schematic shows the energy of the waves. So it is a snapshot. It's actually propagating and uh, moving forward or outward. In the upper right is the second example. It is a different physics uh, for simulating the compressible flows. And uh, the, oh, sorry, the three schematics are showing the uh, shock waves in two-dimensional spaces. And the third thing is also uh, fluid dynamics, but uh, it is working in 3D. We call this problem as a uh, Sposani jet in cross flow. Um, this specific calculation takes 1.3 billion degrees of freedom, so it's quite expensive. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about my day job. Uh, we call it OPC. That's another example for the application of scientific computing. In the left pen, this is an, uh, the OPC is an operation that uh, we make it possible to print patterns to silicon for making semiconductor chips. It is part of the important technology that we call photolithography, and uh, we play the silicon subtract at the bottom, and we share light from the top. And between the light and the silicon, we have the math defining the pattern which we want to print. And the process will, the, the whole process will print the pattern we defined on the mask to the silicon on the nest. And then right here, um, because the features that we want to print are too small, so that we have to make some tricks to them so that they can really print, or we can really print the desired patterns on the silicon substrate. The process of the, the trick or the correction is what we call optical proximity correction. So it takes a lot of uh, calculation, like uh, we usually deal with millions or billions of such uh, patterns or figures. So we use a lot of computers to compute them. We as OPC engineers, we need to develop algorithms and uh, design our data structures and write the code to make the operation really fast and uh, robust. It doesn't, it cannot crash like uh, today or tomorrow. It has to go through a robust calculation. So that is the background. So of course there are many, many other applications, but those two fields are what I am good at. So I really write code for them. I know almost everything from top to down. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about, with this background, let's talk about what make Python bad. So the most obvious point is the lack of robustness. So like the example code here, um, we, we have a point class, and uh, we assume it will take x and y in the Cartesian coordinate. So when we uh, having the real number input, it will print the correct, uh, uh, the length function will compute the correct length and print it. But if we give them strings, which looks okay, but the computation will fail because string cannot take a uh, square root, right? Um, so this is a problem. And how to solve it is by testing and documentation in Python. Uh, they can mitigate the lack of robustness because once you test and you can make recommendation to your users how to use this class or the library. Uh, this practice is good um, and we should encourage writing tasks and writing documents. However, it does not change the fact that this kind of allowed dynamicity uh, hurt the robustness of the, full of the system we are developing. A more serious issue is uh, speed or slowness. What do you mean is uh, Python is slow? But let's, let's, let's do this step by step. First, let's uh, talk about uh, what I mean by fast or speed. So speed comes from uh, in computer that come from using less instructions or assembly to do calculation. So when we want to make things really fast, we want the number of instructions to be either one or zero. Okay. Well, it doesn't sound ma make a lot of sense to make instruction into zero, right? So let's just reduce the instruction. The upper half of the example code is the C++ part that we write. Uh, so that we define the data structure and we want to access the element in the memory buffer that it defines. In the lower half, you can see that this access after compilation really just take one instruction. So this is fast. Okay? We do things and we use as few instructions as possible. Then Python does not offer that. So the dynamicity or dynamic typing feature in Python is not only dangerous as we saw in the previous second slide, but it is also slow. And uh, this lack of speed is actually more serious issue than the type safety. 
This is the Python version of the data, uh, data access I showed in the previous slide. And um, this looks simple, right, as how we access data in Python. But uh, I'm going to, uh, th it contains two ways to do the data access. So, so it's uh, because Python is more flexible. But I'm going to show you that either way is fast enough. <clears throat> Let's see why. Um, yeah, the font is a little bit small <coughs> um, because that uh, the two naive simple lines of data access in Python will expand to a whole bunch of C code. So in the upper left, it is our original Python code. It, uh, for the first access pattern, I call it the container style. So it will call into the C function pi object set item, which is in the Python interpreter. Okay. And uh, the set item function is expanded in the left pane. And you see there are like two groups of conditional branching uh, functions. And it will in turn cause a lot of helper functions. Okay. By no means it can be one instruction, right? It definitely involves a lot of function calls, a lot of testing, um, probably 10 or 20 or even 30 instructions in CPU. So the second way uh, is to call the set attribute. It's an attribute style memory access or data access. So it is expanded in the right pane, and you are seeing there are four groups of testing for the condition and uh, even more helper functions to help the access. Um, so you know, this is one reason that Python, X, Python is slow. Even the data access will involve dozens of instructions. And you cannot avoid it. So Python is dynamic, and uh, the dynamicity is both gen uh, dangerous and slow. In many applications, speed is a king. We just need things to run fast. So to get the performance without giving up the productivity and flexibility provided by Python, we need to do something. First is to decide the software to have the scripting language to control the execution flow. We, we, we like Python. We want to use Python when it makes sense. So we keep it in the flow control and uh, for execution. Then we use C++ to manage the resources and generate fast assembly. In the end, we grew Python and C++ together. Okay? Um, that's the general concept, and right now I'm going to use the following 10 minutes to show you what techniques or skills we should learn or acquire to really make these things happen. Hey, first thing to know is that Python uses dynamic location. Hey, whenever you have a Python object, no matter how simple it looks like, it has dynamic location behind the scene. Okay? Because when you have uh, uh, created a Python object, it will actually call this guy and it will call the pi, uh, yeah, pi object malloc. In turn, it will call malloc in your standard C library. Okay. If you are lucky, then something has already been catched or allocated, but you still need to test if that happens. <clears throat> and Python, is, uh, Python objects is all dynamic, using dynamic memory, so that it cannot work as C or C++. It actually has its own virtual machine and has its own stack, a calling, uh, calling stack. So um, we actually can do a lot of things by using that. It's uh, convenient and uh, also dangerous. Uh, like the, the example code here, we can access the stack frame during runtime, Python runtime. Uh, in this example, the caller has a local variable and it calls show stack without any argument. So the variable is staying in caller not in show stack. In show stack, we first print the call stack. So it uh, actually is a common technique for you to implement your own debugging tool. But that's not all. Uh, we, 
in the core, in the show stack, we can actually peek into the local variable of our caller. So you can see that the output in the button, that, uh, which I print in the show stack, I am printing the local variable of my caller, which was then, was then passed into my local variable. Okay. This is not good, but uh, it allows you to understand how the interpreter is really working. Hmm? Where's my script? Okay, um, but after, after knowing the differences does not allow you to make the two worlds to combine together, right? Um, we still need some tools to help us to make the bridge between Python and C++. There are many, many tools. I'm listing maybe 10% of existing tools for making the wrapping. Um, but today I'm I'm going to just mention the last one called Python 11. If you want to use C++ and you want to use Python, forget everything except Python 11. I'm going to tell you why. So this is a simple, anal simple analysis for the good and bad of the tools for wrapping. Because we want to wrap C++, so what we really should use are the button, uh, button two tools, which is uh, which are Boost Python and PyBind 11. But Boost Python, it, it offers very good functionality. The only problem is that it is Boost. So if you write C++, you, have, you probably already know Boost or you are using Boost because it is a comprehensive and powerful library that uh, it, it's so robust that uh, we call it de facto standard library. But the problem is that it has a lot of legacy, it has a long history. So it's very difficult for you to trace. But PyBy11 kind of remove all those baggage coming from our history, and you can easily trace and even tweak PyBy11. And it offers smaller binary and faster speed. So use PyBy11 if you want to write new code. After having the wrapping, wrapping library, uh, we still want to pick a build tool so that it can help us to build the C++ and make it executable. Now, we don't need to do that for Python, right? But when we tap into the compile language land, we need a compiler and we need a build tool to control the compiler. So here I want to recommend you CMake. Uh, it is a cross-platform, robust, and well-supported uh, well supported tool. PyBind 11 also has out-of-the-box support for CBIC. This is the, show, the showing for how CMake works. The left, uh, left half is the control file for CMake. It's called CMakeList.txt. And the right hand is uh, uh, PyBind 11 wrapping code. So after you finish all the build process, uh, you, you can import this build extension module just like a regular Python, extension, uh, Python module and run the distance function that we define in it. Okay. So we have a working system. But to make, it, to make the working system fast, this is an important technique to reduce the memory copy as much as possible. This is important, I will repeat it one, on and on. So this is what I call zero copy. The uh, memory copy is very expensive in any system. So uh, as long as we reduce it, our system will run much faster. And uh, in Python world, we can do this easily by using NumPy, because we can share the buffer defined in NumPy between Python and C++. So in the lower half, we have two approaches to do the uh, buffer sharing, but uh, let's not see the left, uh, lower left because it's not good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, it's actually the easy way to go from top to down by defining things in Python and uh, do manipulation in lower level C, C or C++, but it does not give you a robust system. So if you want to, want to define a fast running and uh, easy to maintain system, 
you should uh, control all the data buffer in C++. It takes more code, but you know, you know where every byte goes. And that's important when you want to serve serious users and to answer their question, where are my data gone? Why I am taking 100 gigabyte? Right? You cannot answer that question by having NumPy array in Python. PyPy 11 provides um, two ways to share the buffer. So the first approach is to use the buffer protocol, which is showing the left hand side. It turns the wrapped object into one single array. The other way to do it is to use a NumPy ND array. Um, they work similar, but NumPy ND array allows you uh, allow one object return any number of uh, data buffer. Okay, so just pick one as it fits. Or as an adult, we can have both, right? <laughs> uh, once we have the efficient uh, data passing or zero copy between Python and C++, uh, we also need to consider how to make the C++ computing code fast. Um, you just need to be experienced and uh, spend time to optimize and know a lot about how compiler generate assembly, right? Um, but a key operation in the process is that when you have your binary com compiled, compiled and linked, you should see what is really the instructions generated by the compiler. So this example is a simple distance calculation code, but we use two different sets of compiler options. One is that we ask compiler to use AVX, Intel AVX instruction set. The other doesn't, so it only uses SSE. You can see that the left-hand side, we have AVX2 turned on, so the compiler generates the instruction using AVX, which is 256-bit wide SIMD. But on the right-hand side, it only has SSE turned on, which is half over the width for SIMD. So with AVX, the same, as, uh, the same number of lines actually runs twice fast as SSE. And how do you know that? You have to read the data sheet of Intel CPU and to know, oh wow, with AVX, I can run twice as fast. And do you want it? Of course you do, right? <laughs> Something, um, running twice as fast by just adding one switch is like a free lunch, and we definitely want it. But uh, you need to check the assembly to make sure. Uh, AVX, I think, is almost like 10 years old, so almost all Intel CPU has AVX right now. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that when you generate a machine code, you have this good instruction turned on. Some other important techniques include managing resources between C++ and Python, okay? So there are times that we still need to copy data, um, and zero copy does not resolve every problem. So we still need to manage the memory or other resources so that we can minimize the overhead when, uh, when we can do it. Python uses reference count to manage object uh, lifecycle. In C++, we can do the same thing. Uh, we don't need to, but we have the same kind of facility, and it actually runs faster. Uh, but the reference counting involves lock, uh, so in, um, it has additional overhead when you are running in multi-threading environment. So uh, we, we should be very careful when using that. In Python, you don't really have the, ch the choice, because Python always uses reference count. So um, we, this is a big topic, but uh, we, we should be aware of this matter of fact and uh, study when you need to make the design decision for multi-threading. PyPy 11 supports the translation of reference count between C++ and Python. This translation is important because once you use reference count in C++ and pass into Python, or get Python 
uh, to access reference counted uh, entities in C++. You want to make sure the count uh, are compatible. Like uh, if you decrease the reference count in one place but not in the other place, you probably have having release the memory and still accessing it. So that will just crash your system. Or you can have resource leak. Uh, if we don't reference count in C++, we can actually can limit that in Python and keep our C++ system to be reference count and lock free. Uh, but it's actually even more complex. Uh, it's complex and interesting, so we can discuss it offline. <clears throat> there are some other techniques like uh, running Python in C++. We can do that by Python 11 API, but don't do the lower la uh, the, the, the bottom line by writing embedded Python in C++. You will never be able to maintain it. Python 11 even offer more capability and make you to write C++ like Python so that you can actually debug it one by line just like Python. But of course, you need, you need GDB. Okay. But it's very beautiful, right? It's mapping one by one, <laughs> one line by one line. So all those things allow us to spend time in compilation so that we don't need to spend time in runtime. So this is a, an example um, in the middle of the code that uh, we determine the content value element size during compile time. So when calling item size, it is actually called in compile time. Constants are actually inserted into code. So we are generating zero instruction for that. So it's even better, right? Also, it sounds insane. C++ allow us to do that. And we can also reduce runtime errors. This example code is complicated because it tried to um, um, generalize the wrapping logic for all the wrapper. When you have like a 10 classes, each class has uh, uh, 10 methods, you end up with uh, 100 lines for the wrapping. So we want the generalized and centralized way to control the wrapping. We can also decouple the resource management from algorithms so that uh, when we have an array describing how many dimensions it has, uh, we don't need to manage resource. We keep it in another construct. So I'm almost out of time, so I'm going really, really fast. Um, so I'm not going to explain what this diagram shows. You know it's complex, right? But uh, we can use all those uh, high-level description uh, to, con uh, to calculate the uh, conservation of quantity around that boundary. And all these are generating just dozens of instructions, even though it looks pretty complex. In Python, no, you cannot do that. Okay, so I draw the conclusion that uh, we want fast code so that we have to move from Python to C++. If your system requires speed, think about it in the beginning. Don't trust Python for speed. I am not saying Peter was wrong. He was right that Python is high performance, but he also mentioned that the number crunching part is in the machine code, right? That's the secret. So if you don't have a team like in Anaconda to write machine code for you, you see plus plus, okay? <laughs> um, so there are more information uh, in the uh, uh, GitHub. So I actually have been taught this course for two semesters, and I'm going to teach again in this semester. Uh, comments and uh, opinions are welcome. And if you want to write some of that, kind of cool code. I do have a lot of open source projects for you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for sharing how to make our code more efficient. Now we have, we have about three minutes for QA time. Is there any question? You can raise your hand. Thank you for sharing. Uh, 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 I have four questions for, for asking. And uh, uh, about the first one, uh, uh, as we know that there are so many dangerous issues between the uh, Python and C++, and why can I, at the beginning, let we write in the code 
and we choose the C++. And, okay. uh, oh, okay. do I, should I answer it one by one or at once? Uh, uh, how about I, I, I ask all, all of them? Sure. Okay. And uh, uh, the second question is, uh, uh, is this designed for some, uh, some demand? And would you show, show us the, the real case? And, uh, is this, is, and uh, also, is this possible for implement the mixed language project code? And the, third, the third question is, the, uh, as we know, the, uh, the C++ uh, uh, property type have three, three types, uh, the public, the uh, protect, and the uh, private. And uh, the Python has only one, one type, uh, public. And how can we be uh, pre prevent it in that? And uh, the fourth question is, uh, the op optimization type has two. Uh, one is the fertilization, and the second one is the parallelization. And can, can it implement on the Python? Yeah, that's more my question. Okay, thank you very much. So the first part is uh, how to prevent the danger in C++, right, when we are calling or accessing from Python. Um, that's one reason I recommend Python 11. So it already has factored in the consideration for type safety. So most of the time, if you are doing something wrong, it doesn't compile. Isn't that good, right? It doesn't work so that you know something's wrong. Uh, but still, there are some uh, danger, like uh, when you are sharing the buffer, then nothing is protecting you. You just need to know exactly what you're doing. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't share buffer, okay? <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing about reference counting, just don't use it, okay? Follow what PyPy11 tells you to do. So that's, I think, the sector that I can give to uh, a beginner. And the second is uh, for you, uh, real cases, right? Uh, I think in the slide I'm showing the real cases. Oh, not, not, not I feel, I do, I did share use cases. So I made all those diagrams myself, okay? They are part of my past researches and the code was written in the hybrid system. Uh, but that uh, kind of antique I was still using C types, which is something I didn't even mention. It's extremely difficult, extremely dangerous. Don't use that. Okay. Um, and for OPC, uh, that's my day job. So of course I, I cannot say anything in detail, uh, but I write code that every day, even yesterday. <laughs> uh, no, no, yesterday I take a day off. So the day before yesterday. <laughs> so, um, but if you are interested in, in real world problem, I, I can of course offer you open source part. Uh, I kind of open source anything in my, re in my personal research or my academic research. Uh, so that's what we are talking about. Uh, so can you remind me what the third question is? The third question is the, uh, the data privacy. C++ oh. has the three types. Yeah, uh, access control of, uh, between the uh, for the difference in C++ and Python. Okay, so if we make something accessible in Python, then there's no protection. But on the other hand, if you do want some protection of your internal encapsulation, you should do it in C++, right? Don't expose it into Python because they are detail that you don't want people to know. So I would regard it's more like a feature or capability rather than limitation. By introducing C++, you are allowed to have something protected, either in protected or, Python, uh, or private, right? And what's the fourth question? Uh, is the two-measure two optimization method can implement on Python? Oh, yeah, I think we should take that offline. Yeah, I, I did both vectorization and uh, OHMP multi-threading and MPI for digital memory processing. I can tell you that can, can it probably cost one or two PhD. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I believe we are running out of time, so we appreciate the speaker and all the audience for making this session success.